They are for convening having arrived. All members of the House will please come to the floor and take their seats. All members of the House will please report to the floor. The clerk will ring the bell. All members, please come to the floor. We have a schedule to keep this morning. We're going to do the roll call here momentarily. We're going to have the morning roll call. All members present will please vote green to signify their presence in the chamber, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? Have all members now voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines. Well, good morning to each of you. Kind of weak. Don't get a second chance either. Doorkeepers will please close the doors and keep them closed. We will ha have scripture reading and prayer by the chaplain, after which we will pledge allegiance to the flag of our country. Our chaplain this morning will be introduced by the gentleman from the 46th House District, Representative John Carson. Representative Carson. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen of the house, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, pastor of the day today is Pastor Bryant Wright. Pastor Wright is my pastor. He's a senior pastor at Johnson's Ferry Church, which has 8,300 members right up just north of here in Cobb County and seven Sunday morning worship services. He's accompanied by Thomas Nelson, the teaching pastor and college and singles pastor. Thomas, if you'll, if you'll stand, please. You've, most of you probably have heard uh, Pastor Wright uh, through his Right from the Heart Ministries. He founded and is, is still the chairman of Right from the Heart Ministries, which is obviously on the radio and television. He founded it in 1992. Uh, he's on six major radio stations in Georgia and 56 in Florida. That seems kind of disproportionate. but um, he, His radio broadcasts are in four languages, including in, in five countries, uh, including the U.S., are Mexico, Poland, Spain and Kenya. He has been on television on N N uh, NBC, CNN, ESPN, MSNBC, and Fox News. He has an undergraduate in uh, arts from the University of South Carolina. He is an avid Gamecock fan. <laughs> the speaker said, turn the mic off. <laughs> As long as they're playing UGA, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> Committee assignments has not met yet, have they? <laughs> I better keep moving. Um, Master, uh, Pastor Wright has a Master of Divinity from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and two honorary doctorate degrees. He was also president of the Southern Baptist Convention from 2010 to 2012. He was also, uh, he's visited here at the Capitol before in the 1980s, uh, introduced by another Cobb County State Representative, State Representative Johnny Isaacson. 
I am not running for U.S. Senate. I just want to point that out. Pastor Wright is married to Ann Wright, and August 17th, you celebrated 40 years of marriage. Congratulations, sir. He has three sons, and I'm sure they don't give him any headache at all. So please welcome uh, my friend, who you'll recognize from right from the heart, Pastor Bryant Wright. Thank you, Representative Carson, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing the mic to continue on. I know one reason y'all probably are not fond of South Carolina is because of our football coach that is especially loved by Georgia graduates. And I want you to know, I, I hated him when he was at Florida myself, but I've come to believe he's a great godly man now that he's at Florida. <laughs> I want to also thank you for your service to our state and to our fellow man. I know in many ways you have a thankless task, but a task that never ends. You're all way underpaid for all the hours that you put in, whether the legislature is in session or out of session. So thank you for the role you play. And I'd like to take a few minutes just to kind of come back to basics and look and see what God's Word says about the role of government. I read to you from the book of Romans, chapter 13. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Do you realize, every one of you, that you are servants of God? Now, I realize some of you don't believe in God. I understand that. But according to the scriptures, the calling of government service is to be a minister of God. And it's very interesting in verse 1 when it says, There's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Out of the 10 million citizens of Georgia, you have been chosen for a vitally important leadership role. Now, I realize when you read this in the Word of God, you may be skeptical and you think of all the corrupt and evil government officials, not only in America, but in any nation around the world. And you think, can that really be true that those in government have been chosen by God? And I realize that's a hard question to understand. I can't even give you an adequate answer, but I do know this. God has allowed you to be in this key leadership role, in a leadership role in government at this point in history. And with that, we want to see what God's Word says to us about the role of government. One thing it says is that we as citizens are in subjection to governing authorities. And it says, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And it goes on to say, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Well, we are called as citizens to submit to government authority. And that means that when we don't, we're going to live in fear. I know that fear when I'm flying down the road of life. And I notice a flashing blue light in my rearview mirror. And I realize I'm about to face the judgment of government. And I also realize that most every time it occurs, I definitely deserve it. But I also know that when there is just government, there is no cause for fear when we seek to do what is right. Now, the question arises here, well, what about unjust government? And we certainly know there are cases of periods in our history through civil disobedience that certain leaders like Martin Luther King and others seeing the inherently unjust laws of segregation and discrimination, felt that they needed to oppose this through civil disobedience. 
And yet, even Dr. King realized that when unjust laws are opposed and ignored, there is still the consequences that will have to be paid, whether it's going to prison or facing fines, because government has been ordained to maintain a sense of order in culture. I know the movie Selma is out now, and if you've ever been to Selma and walked from Selma across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which interestingly enough was named for a U.S. Senator from Alabama who was a Brigadier General from the Confederacy and became the Grand Dragon of the KKK in that region. And what an ironic spot when civil rights workers walked across that bridge. And if you've ever walked across it from Selma, you cannot see when you begin to approach that bridge, what's going to be on the other side? It had to be an awesome and frightening and terrifying sight. <coughs> what those marchers saw when they cleared that bridge and began to face that kind of government brutality. And yet when it occurs, the consequences of disobedience means to pay the fine and pay the penalty. But God's word does go on and say this in verse 4. For it is a minister of God to you for good. If you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on those who practice evil. Now, what the scriptures are telling us is that those who serve in government are a minister of God, a servant of God. And government has three key roles. It is to punish evil. It is to uphold justice. It is to work for the common good. Now, when you think about that basic calling, we realize that is a restraint on sin and evil. And government has been given power to protect the citizens from evil, from within, through law enforcement in the courts. Government is given power and weaponry to protect the citizens from without, through the military. Government is to restrain evil, to administer justice for the common good. Now, in that light, we're dealing with some very interesting issues in our day. And religious liberty is one of those interesting issues. You see, we are living in a society that is on a collision course with the choice between erotic liberty and religious liberty. And what just happened with Fire Chief Cochran in the city of Atlanta, even though it is not your business, I realize, that is out of the mayor's office, it is just one example of what our culture is going to increasingly see in regards to issues of erotic liberty versus religious liberty. And we're liable to see this with our military chaplains in the years ahead if they, in good conscience before God, in honoring the scriptures, feel they cannot perform same-sex weddings and may be kicked out of the military. There is just no telling what we're going to face. But even the mention of that is a reminder of the importance in your role in seeking to understand how we can have a government that is just, that is a protection of its citizens against evil, that is working for the common good. And I do encourage you in all that you do to be seeking the wisdom of God that is found in the scriptures and to recognize historically in our nation's heritage that religious liberty really is a foundational aspect not only of our constitution but it has also been for the common good and welfare of man. And even though the majority of your constituencies have now embraced erotic liberty as a primary virtue over religious liberty, I hope that you men and women will consider our heritage in thinking about the role of government in not only protecting the citizens and administering justice, but also working for the common good. And that's where we're really partners. Because 
your role in government is about restraining sin. You know, I get tickled when people say on a certain moral issue, well, you just can't legislate morality. And I want to ask you folks, well, why do you meet down here? Have you ever known of a law in the state of Georgia that wasn't about legislating morality? It's all about the restraint of evil. I know what a person means by that. You can't change people's hearts. You can't change their desires by legislation. I understand that. But government has a key role in restraining man's sin and evil. And that's where those of us who are ministers of the gospel join with you. We are partners with a different role. Our calling is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. It is not a calling about restraining sin as the role of government is, but it is a calling about the transformation of the inner man by recognizing that God loves each of us so much that he has sent his son Christ to not only die on the cross for our sins, but to rise from the dead and to give us a way that when we accept this and believe this and appreciate it, we are so transformed from within because we realize we have become a child of God and we're a citizen of the kingdom of God. And I really believe that when we do our job right and seek to share the good news of the gospel, we are working really hand in hand with you in the role of government. Because if we're good citizens in the kingdom of God, as followers of Christ, then we'll be better citizens of Georgia and the United States. So as you reflect on your role and the importance of government, may God give you great wisdom. May God bless you in all that you do. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for every person in this room. Out of the 10 million citizens of Georgia, they have been chosen for a vitally important role of leadership in government. And as we think about the role of government according to the teaching of Scripture, I pray that as they examine the decisions they face, that they'll be asking, does this help to protect our citizens in administering justice and punishing evil? And is this working for the common good? Lord, may you guide them. May you direct them. May you strengthen them. May you watch over them. May you bless them throughout this session and every single day. For we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Lord bless you. Doorkeepers will unlock the doors.
chair recognizes the chairman of the Committee on Information and Audits, Chairman Chokas. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Information and Audits has reviewed the journals of the previous legislative day and have found them to be correct. Chairman Chokas of the Committee on Information and Audits reports that the journal of the previous legislative day has been read and found to be correct. Is there any objection to the confirmation of the journal? The chair hears none in the journal is confirmed. The clerk will read the resolution establishing the order of business for the day. Mr. O'Neill, the 146 moves that the following be established as the order of business during the first part of the period of unanimous consents. Introduction of bills and resolutions. First reading and reference of House bills and resolutions. Second reading of bills and resolutions. Morning orders. Is there any objection to the adoption of the resolution establishing the order of business for the day? The chair hears none and the resolution is adopted. First reading of bills and resolutions. The clerk will read. House Bill 15 by Representative Turner, the 21st, Kelly, the 16th, Pack of the 108th, Teasley of the 37th, Cantrell, the 22nd, and others. A bill entitled an act to amend Chapter 10 of Title 25, the official code of George Annotator, relating to the regulation of fireworks. Regulated Industries. House Bill 16 by Representative Prince, the 127th, a bill entitled an act to amend Part 14 of Article 6 of Chapter 2 of Title 20, the official code of George Annotator, relating to certain programs and activities on the Quality Basic Education Act. Education. House Bill 46 by Representative Turner, the 21st, Caldwell of the 20th, Stover the 71st, Spencer the 180th, Barr the 103, and others. A bill entitled an act to amend Article 10 of Chapter 2 of Title 21 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to absentee voting. Governmental Affairs. House Bill 47 by Representative Cooper, the 43rd, Meadows the 5th, Hawkins the 27th, Hatchet to the 150th, Beverly the 143rd, and others, a bill in, to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 26-4-80, the official code of Georgia annotated, relating to the dispensing of prescription drugs. Health and Human Services. House Bill 48 by Representative Coleman of the 97th and Rice of the 95th. Bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 40-2-85-3, the official code of Georgia annotated, relating to special license plates. Motor vehicles. House Bill 49 by Representative Harrell on 106, Ninth the 130th, Flood of the 64th, Pile of 171st, and Houston of the 170th. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 48 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to revenue and taxation. Ways and Means. House Bill 50 by Representative Benton of 31st, Buckner of the 137th, the Green of the 151st. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 50-3-1 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to the description of the state flag. State Properties. House Bill 51 by Representative Benton of the 31st and Stevens of the 164th. A bill to, to be entitled an act to amend Article 3 of Chapter 4, Title 48 of the 80th Official Code of Georgia Annotator relating to the redemption of property sold for taxes. Judiciary. House Bill 52 by Representative Quick of the 117th, Caldwell of the 131st, Jones of the 62nd, Oliver of the 82nd, Weldon of the 3rd, and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 19-9-1 of the Fish Code of Georgia Annotated relating to parenting plans. Juvenile Justice. House Bill 53 by Representative Waits, the 60th bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 22 of Title 31 of the Fish Code of Georgia Annotated relating to clinical laboratories. Health and Human Services. House Bill 54 by Representative Waits, the 60th, a bill to be entitled an act to amend subpart sub 7 of Part 3 of Article 7 of Chapter 3 of Title 20, the official code of Georgia annotated relating to grants to children of law enforcement officers. Higher education. That completes first readings. Second reading of bills and resolutions, the clerk will read. House Bill 8 by Representative Brooks of the 55th, a bill relating to minimum wage. HB 9 by Representative Brooks of the 55th, a bill relating to general provisions relative to labor and industrial relations. HB 13 by Representative Brooks of the 55th, a bill relating to general provisions relative to identification regulation with regard to motor vehicles and traffic. HB 41 by Representative Smith of the 125th, a bill relating to ethics and government. HB 42 by Representative Smith of the 125th, a bill relating to driving under the influence of alcohol, drugs, and other intoxicating substances. HB 43 by Representative Smith of the 125th, a bill relating to student records. HB 44 by Representative Smith of the 125th, a bill relating to regulation of aeronautics, aircraft, and airports. HB 45 by Representative Smith of the 125th, 
a bill relating to computation of taxable net income. House Resolution 3 by Representative Brooks of the 55th. Resolution expressing profound regret at Georgia's role in slavery, expressing intent that this resolution shall not be used in or be the basis of any type of litigation. Through second readers. I know that some of you are still trying to greet our chaplain. I'm going to ask you if you would to do that with some dispatch. Um, we have morning orders. We have uh, some business to take up. And we have guests coming shortly. The house is going to begin to come to order. All right, uh, we're going on to morning orders. We're going on to morning orders. And given our schedule for today and the number of people who have signed up, chair is going to limit morning orders to one minute each. If you have signed up for a morning order, make your way to the front of the chamber and be ready when you're recognized. Chair recognizes Representative Dudgeon for a morning order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we had reached a 10-month compromise on the solar leasing bill yesterday in subcommittee. Um, we're going to be filing the bill this afternoon. Uh, several people have talked about interested in signing it. This is a compromise between the solar companies, the power utilities, the EMCs, and the MEAGs which will allow um, access to financing for solar installations for small business and residents in Georgia. So if you're interested in signing on to the bill, I have it with me. Come find me. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Representative Dickey for a morning order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, sometimes we're defined by the big moments in our lives, and 37 years ago uh, was a big one for me, and I just want to wish my wife, Cindy, a happy uh, anniversary today. So thank you very much. I'm a lucky man. Chair recognizes Representative Broderick. I'm sorry. Yeah, Representative Broderick for a morning order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Each of you have got on your desk this morning an um, invitation from the Georgians for a Healthy Future for a panel discussion, bipartisan panel discussion at the Freight Depot in the morning, 730, if you would, RSVP today. And uh, I think it would be a, a good chance for us to discuss and seek some innovative issues to dealing with the health care issues in our state. I invite you to please attend and participate. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Burns for, and uh, Chairman Knight jointly for a morning order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tomorrow is Coastal Sportsman's Day and Georgia's Legislative Sportsman Caucus Day. For those of you who have not been here before, Chairman Knight's going to tell you how you can join up with the caucus um, for sportsmen. It's a great day, so we look forward to seeing you downstairs in the morning. Chairman Knight. You may have seen uh, on your desk the sign-up form. We do this at the beginning of every term. This is our Georgia Legislation Sportsman's Caucus, and, and your sign-up to be a, a part of it. 
Guys, this is part of a big, uh, bigger caucus. We've got the uh, Congressional Sportsman's Caucus at the federal level. The governors have one, and this is the state level one. So again, for you new guys, uh, we appreciate your participation and, and showing your support for the outdoor sportsmen, uh, men and women, and their fishing and hunting activities in Georgia. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Roberts for a morning order. Come on. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight down at the depot starting at 530, most of you should have on your desk uh, the alligator for the Okie Finoki night. So I've got several members here. Some are not in here right now. But come down there and join us. Get you a little gator tail and, and have some fun and, and, and fellowship with us. So it's from 5.30 to 8.30 at the depot tonight. You're all invited. Thank you. Thank you. And I've lost a gray pen. If anybody finds it, it looks like a feather. Thank you. <laughs> Violated the rules of the house there, Madam Chair. But I know that pen's important. Okay, we can, uh, it's gonna be up to y'all. If y'all wanna come back after the state of the state and do some, a little bit of business, we can. But if you'll stay at your seat and uh, Work with us here. We can get take we can take care of that before uh, we have the state of the state. We have a resolution that you may want to give some attention to. Clerk will read the caption to House Resolution 19. House Resolution 19. House Resolution 19 by Mr. O'Neill, the 146, a resolution relative to adjournment and for other purposes. Chair recognizes the majority leader to present the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, if I could get your attention, please, I, where I don't have to make 100 copies of this for you later. If you get it now, it's easier. This is our first adjournment resolution of this session. Uh, it's been agreed to already by our friends over in the Senate, uh, and it takes us through Legislative Day 15. Uh, it's ambitious, that much of a term, but uh, we feel that it's absolutely necessary that you all have as much notice to plan your lives around your service here as is humanly possible. And we feel like this is a, a, a real good start at that and hopefully we'll have one even longer for you uh, on, on the next one. But very quickly, we're doing the first four days of the session this week. Uh, we will be out this Friday as we will be most Fridays from now on. Uh, Unless we have some significant emergency, the plan is to try to stay to four-day week so we always have an extra day for committee work and that sort of stuff uh, as we go forward to do our jobs responsibly. We'll be out the entire week of the Martin Luther King holiday, meaning next week. There will be joint hearings for the Senate in that week. And uh, back that following Monday, which is uh, January 26th, and we'll be in four days that week. So we will have finished eight legis legislative days in the month of January. Then we will come back the first week of February, and that is only a three-day week. And the reason for that is it's uh, contemplated by us now that we will have delivered the supplemental budget to the Senate by then, and they have requested a couple of days out of session to let their committees work and get the budget printed for their work uh, so that they can expeditiously deal with the uh, uh, supplemental budget. So that's a three-day week. The next week in February, taking us through Thursday, February the 12th, which will be session day 15, and then hopefully some someday in that, that week of February the 9th through the uh, 12th, 
we'll have another adjournment resolution. Uh, this is, and I will ask the speaker if we are, are able to adopt this this morning uh, to immediately transmit this to the Senate so that they can do it and everybody can begin to plan. All the page people, the doctors of the day people, all of that, all, there's a huge group of folks that uh, set their schedule around what we do. So the quicker we can get this information disseminated to them, the better. Mr. Speaker, I'll be happy to yield any questions. If there are none, I'll be happy to yield the well and ask your favorable consideration of resolution number, I think you said 15, I forgot what you said, whatever number this is, but it's the one up there. You don't appear to have any questions. Thank you, I yield the well. On the adoption of House Resolution 19, all those in favor will vote aye, those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of House Resolution 19. The ayes are 164, the nays are zero. The resolution having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore adopted. For what purpose does the majority leader rise? Mr. Speaker, I move that we immediately transmit House Resolution 19 to the Senate. Majority Leader has moved that the House immediately transmit House Resolution 19 to the other legislative chamber here in this building. Is there objection? Chair hears none and it's gone. Chair recognizes for the final morning order, Representative Bentley. Representative Bentley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, colleagues. If you will, please mark your calendars for Thursday, January 15th, the Georgia Working Families Legislative Caucus meeting. We will come back tomorrow and remind you of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right, here, if you uh, have an announcement, and I know two or three members had signed up for announcements, make your way to the front. We're going to try to get those taken care of. In the meantime, the clerk will read the caption to a group of privileged resolutions. The clerk will read. A resolution honoring the life and memory of Tony J. Zavalich and Joan Zavalich and for other purposes commending Mr. Wilson Moran for his outstanding community service and congratulating him and his wife, Ernestine Moran, on their fifth, 50th wedding anniversary and for other purposes, honoring the life and memory of Jacqueline Champion Owens and for other purposes, recognizing January 26, 2015 as Effingham County Day at the Capitol, saluting the Effingham County Chamber of Commerce and for other purposes, recommending and commending Gunther James R Reed Griffin and for other purposes, Recognizing and commending Jonathan Sinclair Wagner and for other purposes. Recognizing and commending Ms. Diane Green on the occasion of her retirement and for other purposes. That completes the reading of privileged resolutions. Is there objection to the adoption of the privileged resolutions? The chair hears none. The resolutions are adopted. Chair recognizes to introduce the doctor of the day. Representative Beverly, Representative Beverly. Good morning, colleagues. Um, our doctor of the day is Madeline Davidoff. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering from Marquette, earned her medical degree from the Medical College of Wisconsin. She completed her residency in internal medicine at Boston Med 
and Cardio Cardiology Fellowship at Emory University. Dr. David R. specializes in cardiology and manages her solo practice in Macon and Warner Robins. She is a member of the Medical Association of Georgia and serves on various boards and committees. She is past president of Bibb County Medical so Society. I give you Dr. David R. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure to come up here and give some service back to you guys. We really appreciate all the work that you do for the population of Georgia. As a specialist, um, I am very well aware of knowing my own little area, and I have great respect for the seriousness that you take and the work that you put into processing all the different areas for which you're responsible for governing the people of this state in the process. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Remember what he said, I'm a cardiologist, crushing chest pain, I am your girl. Other stuff? I'll try. Have a great day. Thank you. Chair recognizes for an announcement, uh, Representative Flood, Representative Virgil Flood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, the House Democratic Caucus will meet at 8 a.m. in room 406 in the uh, Coverdell Legislative Office Building. 406 tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Chair recognizes for an announcement, Representative Shaw, Representative Jason Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Rural Caucus will have our first organizational meeting of the year today. As soon as we adjourn today, we're going to meet at our normal place at the Department of Agriculture. So we'll have a, a lunch there. So around 12.30, uh, we'll be ready. So rural caucus today. Thank you. Okay, here's why we have been on a fast pace. Because today is Representative Pam Dickerson's birthday. Let's wish her a happy birthday. All right, I'm going to ask this house to begin coming to order. Find your seats and let's begin coming to order. All right, I want you to remain in the chamber. We are going to be at ease for just two or three minutes while we get some technical matters lined up up here. Thank you all for your cooperation. We have completed the business of the house. We will be in a posture to be adjourned after the adjournment of the uh, joint session now. <laughs>